I want to talk to you about critical options. And looking at that, and looking at some of the definitions of options, decision, self-determination, choice, preference, desire. I want to share something with you that's relative to critical options. Because we all have them in our lives. And I want to ask you a question, what is the focus of your life? What is the focus of your life? In life, you have a critical option. You can take a stand in your life, or you can follow the crowd. See, people who follow the crowd, their lives are not focused. They're not immersed in anything. People who take a stand, they're living a life that has some power, a life of achievement, a life that has some meaning. People that are taking a stand in life, they are consciously involved in a process to design a life of substance. People who are following the crowd, these are people that they're just doing what everybody else is doing. So that's a crowded road over there. They're following the followers. I want to talk to you about taking a stand with your life. And what are some of the things we can do that will enable us to give our lives up in a way that has some purpose and meaning, that can be real for us, that can give us a sense of fulfillment, of joy and happiness and peace of mind. See, most people are bored with life. Most people feel that life isn't worth the hassle, that life is just wearing me out. It's boring, it's monotonous. I have nothing to look forward to. Here we go again another Monday morning. T-G-I-F day, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> Here we go again, oh boy. You see what the man meant about many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65? <laughs> Doing the same thing the same way every day, looking at these faces, just walking around. <laughs> I mean, you got to be aware of these faces, they affect you, you know. Try to stay around pleasant faces, and if you have an unpleasant face, try and smile more. It's good for your health. And there's another dividend, you look better too. <laughs> so looking for a way in which we can begin to give our lives some special power. Number one, commit yourself to giving your best at all times. Now that's not easy. See, most people, and particularly those who are working in corporations, they're finding now, they've got to change their behavior. We're now involved in a world economy. We will never do business the way in which we've done business in the past. We will never be able to, in the American workplace, do just enough to get by. Now the standards have been raised. Quality and productivity has been increased because of the competition. And so now average performance will not be enough. This is a new day. Competition is fierce. So people who just, who've been locked into a behavior pattern are working just hard enough to keep from getting fired, they're being laid off. <laughs> are forced into early retirement. It's a new game now. So now more than ever, it's about increased productivity. Now more than ever, it's about superior quality service. Now more than ever, it's about creating a positive atmosphere in the workplace and people that have that competitive age, people that are hungry to make it. So you got to be hungry now. You can't just casually walk around, well, I'll get to it later on. Oh, no, no, this, this is a new day right now. Committing yourself to give your best at all times regardless of the competition to do otherwise or the influences of negative people that will tell you, hey, look here, don't push yourself too much. Now's the time to push yourself, to always get in the habit of giving the best that you have to share. Thinking about a situation where I had, I had to give a lecture out in Los Angeles, California for Xerox Corporation. A part of what I do when I, my profession is doing corporate training. My passion is doing training with kids. So when I go someplace, I always try and arrange for a community group to have a group of young people together for me to work with them on a volunteer basis in the evening. 
So I decided to go into an area of Los Angeles to talk with someone about doing that. And they suggested that I come to speak at a community center right outside Los Angeles at Carson Community Center. And because of the, the gangs in Los Angeles, one of the young men that was coming there to organize it and his mother, he had a twin brother. And he took an interest in me because I have a twin. And his twin brother was the victim of a gang ritual. They brought in a new member in a gang and he had to prove that he was really with them and committed. And his job was just to select anybody at random and kill them. And he did that as this young guy was coming out of a store. So they told me, Mr. Brown, would you come over and talk to the teenagers here? There's a lot of depression and despair and hopelessness and people feeling powerless about the gangs. And bring um, with you some handouts and materials so you can do a workshop. And parents will be involved too. Would you be willing to do that? I said, well, I'm doing a full day seminar and I'm usually just physically exhausted afterwards. How many people you say you're going to have? The we guarantee at least four to five hundred people there. I said, okay, I will come there and work with them and take them through this intensive. It's called Project Respect, how to create a shift in the community, how to get young people engaged in a process of creating positive peer pressure rather than buying into the negative peer pressure instruments and, and techniques of how we can provide ongoing coaching for young people to begin to change how they see themselves and their values and how to resist negative peer pressure. So I came there after working in a seminar, totally exhausted, in that Los Angeles traffic. It took over an hour to get there. Got there, they only had seven people. I had an attitude. I said, you had me come all the way from Los Angeles after working all day just to talk to seven people? You told me over 400 people were going to be here. Where are the parents? Only one parent here. My time is valuable. I've got all this material that we've copied to do a workshop. And so I went on and talked to those young people that were in the room, the seven that were there. And I just gave them a little speech. And then I left. Went back to the hotel. That night around 3.30 in the morning, the phone rang. The minister that invited me called me and said, Mr. Brown, I, I, I've got to ask for your attention for a moment. I said, what, are you, what is it? <laughs> Ken Yada, one of the young men who was there, wanted to talk to you. He was the brother of the guy that was killed. He'd like to talk to you. He's been here for over an hour, and I told him, please don't call you. But he insisted. Would you please talk to him for a moment? I said, yes, put him on the phone. Kenyatta, what can I do for you? He said, Mr. Brown, I listened to your tapes for a long time. I've grown to love you and admire you. Among the things that I heard on your tapes that you said you must deal with circumstances such as you find them. You came in this evening and I admit, no, we did not have the numbers that you asked for. No, we did not deliver as we had promised we would. But we were looking for you, the motivator, to give us some hope. We were depressed, and we don't know what to do. We were looking for some direction. And you were so caught up in pouting with your ego <laughs> because we didn't have the place full. You didn't give us your best. I said, excuse me, I was laying in bed. I sit up then, wait a minute here. <laughs> Now see, part of what won't let us grow in life is number one, we identify when we get feedback. We start taking it personal. Number two, we start to justify. So I became defensive and I said, wait a minute. I worked all day. I didn't charge y'all a quarter for this. I went carpet material. I came over there. I was there to give a training for the people and you, all y'all had to do was bring people there. If you don't do it for me for the next speaker that you have, at least provide an audience for him to work with. He said, are you through, sir? I said, yes. Mr. Brown, you said you must deal with circumstances such as you find them. <laughs> we went round and round for about 45 minutes because my ego on the line, I can't let this young boy out debate me. He was not intimidated. I used all the verbal gymnastics and examples I could. He would not bulge. And I said, okay, I'm sorry. 
give me a break. And he said, it takes a big man to say he's sorry. <laughs> that night, after I finished that young man, I prayed, I stayed on the floor by the bed. <laughs> I said, Lord, if you ever give me a chance to speak again, I don't care if it's one person in the audience, I'm gonna wear that one out. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I want to read something to you called The Builder that kind of touched me. Because when you start looking at giving your best at all times, that's not easy. But when you are committing yourself to doing something, those are the standards that you set for yourself because that's who you are. If you're working on a job where you're miserable, they're not paying you what you're worth. You don't like the work, you don't like the people, and you're dissatisfied. If you have decided to continue to take a paycheck, you owe it to yourself to give it your best effort. If you get in the habit of being mediocre or doing just enough to get by, you're not hurting anybody but you. You're cheating you. The builder. There was a man who was an efficient builder. He had worked for years in a large company and had reached the age of retirement. His employer asked him to build one more house. It was to be his last commission. The builder took the job, but his heart was not involved. He used inferior materials. Timber was poor, and he failed to see the many things that should have been clear to him had he shown even his normal interest in his work. When the house was eventually finished, his employer came to him and said, the house is yours. Here's the key. It's a present from me. The builder immediately regretted that he had not used the best materials and engaged the most capable workers. If only he had known that the house was for him. Whoa. <laughs> If he had made a commitment with his life, with his craft, that I'm going to give my best at all times, even if this is my last job, I'm going to give it my best job because that expresses who I am, he would have been more appreciative of that gift. Would you imagine that? I think that makes a very good point. The next thing is live each day with integrity. Don't try and get over in life. Don't try and cheat. See, a lot of people like to try and cheat. I was with a friend of mine and we were, went into a service station to get some gas. They gave me back too much change. I discovered it down the road and I was turning around going back. Guy said, you're a fool. Hey man, what when they don't give people enough change? You think they flag the people down? <laughs> I said, I'm not responsible for them. I'm responsible for me. I went back and I told the guy, excuse me, sir, you gave me a $20 bill too much. I gave it to the guy, the guy just took it and walked away, didn't say thank you. The guy in the car laughed and said, I told you, you fool. I'd have kept that. I said, I'm not responsible for his attitude. I don't care knowing that he would not say thank you. I would still give it back to him. Because my image of myself says, hey, you don't take something that doesn't belong to you. That's the way my mother raised me. Don't try and cheat. Say, well, you know, this little bit won't count. Everything counts. A friend of mine was on welfare after going through a bad experience. Someone, you know, I think she and her husband became ill, they couldn't work for a while, and they went on welfare after they both became physically well. He said, look here. We don't ever have to go back to work. We're making more money on welfare than we made when we were working with all the Medicaid benefits and, and all of the food stamps and everything. She said, no. She said, we are not going to accept the checks anymore. He said, I'm not going to work. Now you can go to work if you want to. <laughs> she went down to the welfare department and said, don't send any more checks to my house. 
Lady said, excuse me? She said, now I've been working here 25 years. No one has ever come in here and said, don't send any more checks here. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I am. And she went home and told her husband, don't look for any more checks because I told him to cut the check off. Now we've got to find something to do. And they started a paper route and got over 1,500 customers and were making money hand over fist in a spirit of dignity and achievement, not ripping anybody off. That was a critical choice. She could have very easily said, well, everybody else is doing it. Why don't I do it? But she decided not to follow the crowd. I like what um, Whitaker said, what you think about me is none of my spiritual business. <laughs> so when you're keeping integrity with yourself, you know that's gonna bring you under a lot of pressure. The next thing is, don't try to cut a bargain with life. Life is not Donald Trump. <laughs> life will not give you any special deals because you maintain a sense of integrity. Anybody ever try to cut a deal? Raise your hand, please, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you try to cut a deal, there are no deals. There are no deals. You've got to do what you do because, not with any ulterior motives, that you're gonna get some special benefit or some special treatment in the universe. No, doesn't mean that somebody might not steal your car while you're trying to do some good for somebody. No, there won't be any special light around your car. They will take your car too. <laughs> All the good people, you're gonna to go too. You've got to do what you do because that expresses who you are. And for no other reason. They might not have a banquet to recognize you or give you a special little plaque and de dedicate a day in your name. No. Do what you do because that's you. The next thing is dedicate your life to something. Dedicate your life to a cause larger than yourself. See, if you dedicate your life to a cause larger than yourself, you're not following in the crowd. See, if your life is not dedicated to something of value, and I like what Howard Thurman said, who was one of the mentors to Dr. Benjamin Mays, who was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King, he said, the quality of life is often determined by that to which the individual is dedicated. If the dedication of the life is vague and diffuse, the quality is apt to be poor and weak. There is much to be said for the intensity of life. See, most people are not intense about living. Most people are very casual about life. They haven't found anything to become intense about. So when you dedicate your life, you don't care anything about the odds. Somebody say, when the dream is big enough, the odds don't matter. See, when you dedicate your life, you bring on a special power. There's a power in you that people, circumstances, events, and I'm not talking about the physical you, I'm talking about the real you, the indestructible, invincible, perfect essence of who you really are, that can bring a government to its knees, that can change the course of history. When you dedicate your life like a Nelson Mandela, who has decided to sacrifice his freedom, all he has to do is say whatever the government wants him to say, and then let him go free. And he can go to a foreign nation and say, I just said that because I've been in prison for over 20 years. And nobody would say, well, Nelson, you sold out. No one would say that. They would say, wait a minute. Nelson, you gave over 20 years of your life. What more can we ask of you? It's okay. But because of his integrity with himself, and he's dedicated his life to break the back of apartheid and free his people, it was Benjamin Disraeli. He says, nothing can resist the will of a people that will stake even their existence on the extent of their purpose for good. That when you dedicate your life to something, you bring on some powers in the universe that works through you to bring about changes that you would never ever know unless you have dedicated yourself.
so I say to you that there is a Mother Teresa in you. There's some work for you to do. I say to you that there is a Nelson Mandela in you. That that kind of commitment, that kind of spirit, that kind of personal power, that kind of vision of allowing yourself to be used by life is in you that all of us came here to do something, to make a difference. And in a historical context, the world will never be the same again because you came this way. Anytime somebody asks me how I'm doing, I say I'm doing better than good and better than most. And sometimes even better than that. <laughs> Let me tell you where I got that from. When I was involved in broadcasting, I used to have the first hour of my show as a disc jockey in Columbus, Ohio. I used to give an inspirational program. And there was a lady that used to call me by the name of Audrey Pelmore. Audrey worked at University Hospital. Audrey was an enthusiastic personality that everybody liked her. I mean, she had a radiant smile and she was just one of those people. You ever meet one of those people that everybody just liked them? She was one of those kind of folks. Audrey became stricken with muscular sclerosis at a very young age. And after a while, she became confined to a wheelchair. She had children. And because of her, her physical deterioration, she could no longer take care of her children. And she had to be confined to a nursing home, Alum Creek Nursing Home on Nelson Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. Audrey used to have the nurses at the hospital call the radio station and put the phone to her ear. And she would ask for a certain request. And I would ask her to say a few words to the listening audience. One day while I was doing my program, I got a call from one of my regular callers, a young lady by the name of Shirley. <coughs> Shirley, on this particular day, there was a sound in her voice. And I detected that something was wrong. And she said to me, it's nice talking to you, Les. I'll be seeing you. And I said, wait, wait, hold a minute, Shirley. There's something wrong. She says, there's nothing wrong. I said, there is, Shirley. I know you. Come on, Shirley, what's wrong? Where Shirley had been diagnosed as having cancer of the breast. And they told her that she had a 60-40 chance of not surviving. During the time that she had had her medical examination, her husband had become distant. Through the pressure of losing her husband and the illness, she just felt, hey, I'm not the kind of person that can handle suffering. And I'd rather just end it quickly. She was at a critical point in her life. And this is the option that she decided to take. I did everything I could to discourage her, to give her a reason to want to go on living. I was trying to find something that she can hold on to that would give her a sense of hope, some thread. I, and I use scripture and everything. And one of my fallback positions, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And she didn't budge. That did not work. And I was out of my arsenal of what can I do to hold on to her, to get her to change her mind, to create a shift in her thinking. And the thought came to me, I said, Shirley, could you wait until tomorrow? <laughs> she waited for a long time before she answered. She said, why tomorrow? I said, because if you wait until tomorrow, I'd like to take you by to see Audrey Pelmore. You remember Audrey that I talk about all the time on the air? She said, yes. I like her. I would like to meet her. And she met me at the Alum Creek Nursing Home. And when we got there, we were both very silent because I'd made a pact with her that if this was not enough to discourage her from taking her life, then I would honor our agreement and I would just release her. And I was going to talk to somebody else to try and get her. I didn't tell her that. <laughs> As we walked down the hall, I did not know exactly what to expect. I had not seen Audrey for some time. When we walked in the room, there Audrey was, all twisted, physically deformed, 
She had no voluntary use of her arms. She couldn't even fan a fly out of her face. She couldn't get up and move around. And we had to get close to her because her vision was blurred and she can't speak very loudly. And her hearing was somewhat impaired. And as we drew closer to her, I said, Audrey, this is Les. And I have a friend with me named Shirley. How you doing, Audrey? And with what strength she had, she said, better than good and better than most. And surely, I know as the tears begin to form in our eyes, I know she had to be thinking that here this woman is. She's been on her back, a prisoner in her body for 17 years. She can't turn herself. She can't get up and go to the restroom. She said to me, Les, I'd love to be able to get up and walk out of here with you. I'd love to be able to take care of my children, to be a mother to them, to see them graduate from high school. She said, Les, I can't do that. And I'm doing better than good and better than most. Shirley had to be saying within herself, what right do I have to feel sorry for myself? What right do I have to cry out, why me? And she decided and left there with a commitment that she wanted to live with whatever time that she had left, that she had no right to cut the time off. She had no right to do that. And she left there with a new determination, a new spirit about her. And that's something about what we have, that you have. There sometimes your options are frozen. See, Audrey can't walk out of a hospital. She did not have the capacity to take care of her children, but she had a freedom of spirit. And that's what we have, wherever we are, with whatever hand that life has dealt us. We have the freedom of spirit. We can go through life whining and weeping, or we can have the kind of spirit that people will say, hey, there's a blessing to be around that person. The staff at the hospital used to go in her room to be encouraged and inspired by her because she didn't feel sorry for herself. And she didn't go through life blaming everybody. I'm reminded of a young guy who was on a bus, a little young fellow, and some kids were picking at him, some bigger guys, and they kept on thumping him on the head and hiding their hands. And so he got tired of them doing that, and he stood up so he would not be around them out of their reach. And they took him and said, sit down, and set him down. And he stood back up, he said, I don't want to sit down. They said, sit down, didn't we tell you? And they pushed him back down. I don't want to sit down. They said, sit down, and they held him down. And he looked at him, he said, you might hold me down, but I'm standing up inside myself. <laughs> and what we have got to do is know that there's something about you, there's something about us. There's a power in you that regardless of what happens to you, you can stand up inside of yourself. I think that's what the port meant when he says, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there may be for my unconquerable soul. You have an unconquerable soul.